Hi everybody, it's Marcus Fairs again from Dezeen, um, bringing you uh, the latest screen time interview as part of Virtual Design Festival. Uh, we've been quite ambitious today. We've got four speakers, all of them in New York City, and uh, we've come together to talk about books. We've teamed up with Terraform One, which is a, a New York organization, uh, co-founded by Mitch Joachim, who's one of our speakers today. Um, we've got also Eran Chan from ODA Architects. We've got Julia Watson, and Paul Miller, AKA GJ Spooky, who's going to join us soon, we hope. Um, I'd like to stand over, to, I'd like to hand over to, hey, hey Paul, hey. how are you doing? Hey, you doing? Hello, hello. Uh, I'd like to hand over to Mitch, first of all, to set the scene for what this discussion is going to be about. But also I didn't want to feel left out. Each of the four speakers is going to talk about their recent book. And I did a book, right, 13 years ago, it's sold out, but I'm, I'm just going to hold this. So I feel like part of the discussion. Okay, 21st century design. Mitch, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and about uh, this whole um, discussion you put together with us? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Marcus. We're super glad to be here. The Virtual Design Festival. Um, this is going to be something uh, kind of radical, I guess, in, in a moment in time where all of us are in a kind of a, I guess, a transition and hopefully everyone is safe and healthy. And uh, this should be a reprieve from the normal day-to-day -day, you know, doldrums that we might be experiencing. So uh, I'm here with uh, uh, my colleagues and friends, uh, also <laughs> superstars, to talk about uh, the work that we are all doing, our different practices, which range from mostly architecture, urbanism, and landscape, and then uh, certainly ideas about theories of the city or theories in general about digital technology. So uh, we wanted to celebrate uh, this book, which has come out, um, I guess this year officially on ACTAR. And this is called Design with Life, Biotech Architecture to Resilient Cities. And, uh, you know, it's 14 years of work. It's uh, 420 pages because 420 is a very good number to have. And, and it involves Again, over 400 people that have worked on it. Uh, Co-founded this company, Terraform One, with Maria Aolova. Uh, right now, Vivian Kwan is our executive director. And we have an entire board. Uh, Alex Poyer is not, she's here someplace in the background. I uh, was uh, integral in making this happen. Of course, of course Paul is uh, also on the board and other members that have been involved in it. But this book is really kind of the all spark that's talking about this topic today, but everyone has some new books out and we thought uh, it would be great if we just share together our thoughts and engage one another on the kind of the topics that we've been really interested in and kind of tease out what some of those differences are and then maybe relate that all to what we think will happen after this pandemic when it comes to climate change and design after this kind of uh, uh, design, after we succeed in solving climate change. So Thanks, that's Mitch, really the premise for today. Could you just tell us a little bit about Terraform One and what it does, and then I'll get all the other speakers to introduce themselves and also explain the connection between themselves and you. Yeah, yeah, so Terraform One is a 501c3 nonprofit urban, de urban design and architecture think tank. We're located in the Brooklyn Navy Yards normally. Uh, when the Brooklyn Navy Yards are open and it's available to be there. Uh, we think about uh, the near future of our cities and we work primarily in what we call socio-ecological design thinking, knowing that uh, design in and of itself is not enough. There is the capricious public, there is the kind of the political class, our leadership, clients, all of those folks have an influence over the design and engineering and ideas that go into our projects. So that's, uh, that's the basic uh, kind of things that we do when it comes to our work. Our motto is design against extinction. So we are also working with uh, things that don't necessarily have a voice, like creatures that are on the red list or endangered creatures that are um, uh, almost uh, disappearing on this planet. So we everything we design works with live organisms, which is our sort of secret sauce that separates us from many other architectural groups. We always have a live organism involved in our projects. And usually it's an organism that is uh, on the edge of oblivion. So we do our best to give it a chance uh, to survive. By the way, I saw an amazing thing on Twitter earlier today. I don't know whether it checks out scientifically, but it was a, a truck driver in Ireland 
said that for the first time in 20 years, he drove his truck and at the end of the journey, the front of the truck was covered in splattered bugs, which hasn't happened for, for years and years and years because, well, we're not sure why. Is it pollution? Is it pesticides that are killing off all the insects? Something that's happened in the last few weeks of lockdown have caused the insects to return. I remember when I was a child and we'd drive the car in the summer, you had to clean the headlights every, every day to get all the squashed flies and bees and stuff off it. Uh, so th the nature is, is, seems to be springing back during this, this period. Let's go quickly on to Eran. Eran, if you could just introduce yourself briefly as well. Sure. Hi, Marcus. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be uh, among people I admire, but also consider good friends. Um, we are going to be talk a little bit about our book today, Unboxing uh, in New York. But before that, maybe in, in a way of introduction, ODA is, is an architectural studio based in Manhattan. Um, we're interested in, in kind of improving the human condition in cities through the built environment. So we get really kick out of uh, small urban discoveries that allows us to implement new typologies that uh, better serves our generation. And the implement part is important because um, I think clearly uh, the growth of our cities has far exceeded the degree by which uh, new ideas can kind of be realized. And in a way you can say that the rush to accommodate have took priority over the need to assimilate. So we're gonna talk about sustainability, resiliency, uh, biodiversity, uh, all huge ideas that are affecting the human condition. Uh, but I'm very kind of intrigued by the idea how to kind of create these ideas reality. And I think this is the greatest challenge of our generation. Um, even small ideas for architects are becoming challenging to realize in face of our clients. Um, so today, um, I mean, I call everyone um, to sort of collaborate more and that's what we're trying to do lately more than ever. It's becoming common for design uh, profession to compete, I think. Enough with this BS, we need to collaborate together. We're smarter, we're stronger, and we can take over uh, basically the, the narrative, but also win the, the argument of the, the sort of the, the urban future. So maybe I'll start with the book. Should I do that? No, do the book in a minute. We just want to introduce everybody first. But if okay. you could, could you briefly explain your connection with Mitch? Because I understand you're working on a project together at the moment. Yeah, so Mitch and I met uh, through mutual friends and uh, we started kind of discovering what uh, any of us or each of us is doing. And now we're collaborating on quite exciting project in LA. We're gonna share it, uh, both him and I. It's a butterfly sanctuary within uh, sort of a residential building, quite an unexpected uh, place to have uh, this, this type of biodiversity. Great, thank you very much. And now Julia, if you could explain a little bit about yourself what you do and your connection to the other guys. Yeah, hi Marcus, hi everybody. Uh, this is my book, uh, which was published December last year. It's called Low Tech, Designed by Radical Indigenism. Uh, I am a designer and a academic and an author now. Um, and I've been leading this um, investigations into what we call nature-based technologies or indigenous technologies. Um, and this book actually looks at technologies from all across the world, about 120 different nature-based technologies and technologies that we probably wouldn't say are technologies at this point in time. It introduces them into the realm of being possibly technologies. Um, uh, I know Mitch because Mitch has been critiquing my students' work since 2009. I teach at Columbia and I teach at Harvard as well, urban design and how to design cities for climate resilience. Um, Mitch and I also have been working in a bit of a collaborative uh, called The Future Studio, where we're bringing a group of experts together to think about sustainability in, in cities and apply the work that we've been doing and the books and the case studies that we've been exploring to our cities. Great, thank you very much. And finally, Paul, AKA DJ Spooky, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and your connection to the gang. Um, first and foremost, hey everybody, um, uh, Aaron, Mitch, and uh, Julia, nice to meet you. Uh, I'm a writer, artist, and musician based in New York, and much of my work is kind of at an intersection of thinking about 
uh, sound, art, and sort of the technologies that kind of allow us to rethink what is a compositional tool in the 21st century. So for example, I've designed software, for example, like uh, iPad apps, or I publish books with MIT Press. Um, much of my work is kind of uh, right now in transition because of this whole uh, viral situation because we can't do concerts anymore. So some people know me mostly for DJing. And I've been DJing globally, um, major large scale festivals over the years. Um, and I produce and work with people as diverse as Yoko Ono or um, Brian Eno or other people who are involved with sound and art. Um, and yeah, I guess one, this is one of my more recent books. It's called Sound Unbound. Um, I work with David Byrne from Talking Heads, uh, Laurie Anderson, a whole bunch of different pretty uh, major figures to get people's sense about design and sound. Um, to me, at least right now, it's, an, it's a time to hit the reset button on the creative process because we're going to be seeing a radical evolution of urbanism in relationship to this whole pandemic situation. And one of the first terms that really comes to mind right now is exponential thinking, um, how we think about the world of, of how things spread and grow and evolve. Um, so my next book is, amusingly enough, in a similar vein, it's called Digital Fictions, The Future of Storytelling. And I explore uh, different narrative strategies uh, that different writers over the last couple centuries have engaged to think about the spread of ideas. So for example, William S. Burroughs, uh, was a big influence on my thinking. He, came, he coined the term language is a virus. Um, and he was one of the major beat poets of the 1950s and things like that. So um, um, that book is in process and it'll probably be done later this year because I have a lot more free time <laughs> uh, than I normally do. Um, and that's a good point. That's We're probably, kind of, yeah. That's a good point. We're probably going to see lots of books being published around about Christmas time because everyone is <laughs> kind of the, one of the few things everyone could, could, can do. Thanks so much, Paul, for the introduction. You're cheating a bit because you're talking about like five books and everyone else has just been restricted to one, but that's okay, we'll let you off. <laughs> but let's go back to the beginning and Mitch. So it's show, show and tell time, everybody. So if you can get your books ready to, to talk about, I think some of you have prepared presentations instead of the old school way of doing it, which is just to flick through the pages. But anyway, over yeah. to you, Mitch. How are you gonna present your book? Tell us all about yeah, it. Yeah, uh, well, I, I could try and do this, you know, present it like this, like, uh, we did when we were in kindergarten, right? Gently read pages to everyone in a soft voice. And we talk about the content of the book. Uh, it's chuck filled with all kinds of uh, things we've been working on over the years, but I do have some slides to make it easier uh, for everyone to view it at home because it's really difficult to see design of life in this format. Um, Go for it. Go for it. And so let me just share a screen and, and uh, show you what's been going on with us. So, yep. Uh, this is uh, so. This is uh, Terraform One. We look all, uh, often at what the big crisis might be on this planet, and we design for that crisis. This one here is a picture of Hurricane Sandy, uh, which is certainly a big one, but uh, I think we're in a bigger one now. Uh, and after this crisis, we want to solve or help solve something like this, which is wildlife population on this planet is fifty percent less than it used to be. That's every creature, fish, coral, bird, insect has been dying off. Almost 50 to 60% of them are gone forever on this planet. We've got to stop that uh, sort of idiocy. We're all complicit. That's everyone in, in our fields and certainly people outside. So we need to do our best as humans to make sure these creatures get a chance or animals. This is the white rhino, almost all gone. Uh, there's only two left, they're called endlings when there, there's only uh, a one or two remaining on this planet. My daughters will never get a chance to see them and many other creatures. So this to us is very much about design against extinction. And that's, that's the, the kind of the challenge we've set for ourselves. We do projects like this, which look holistically throughout the entire city and transform it. This is 42nd Street. You can see the Chrysler building in the background. And our ideas here is to imagine what a socio-ecological city could be. So we put a riparian corridor through the center, trackless trains instead of cars. We've got vertical access wind turbines and solar cells on buildings and streetlights. And we've got all kinds of biodiversity happening on every possible surface imaginable as a kind of maximal approach to urban design and to think about the future of our cities. Uh, we do this also at smaller scale. So this is my daughter sitting on a chair that you can eat it's made out of mycelium and acetobacter. 
Uh, it's actually grown from agricultural waste. It's fitted into bamboo slots. And you have a chair that takes seven days to grow, not like Ikea chairs, which, well, I don't know how they, they produce them, but those things end up in landfills. These chairs end up in your garden after you're done with it. So use it for 10 years and it feeds thousands of other forms of life as it composts back into the earth. We also look at new types of structures. Uh, Julia's also been doing similar work and that's why we get along so well. But here is uh, thinking about a technology that's 2,500 years old. It's called pleaching or grafting inosculate matter together to form one contiguous vascular system. Here making homes where there's no distinction between the house and the landscape. The project was called Fab Treehab. And then other projects we're looking at is thinking about food in cities. This was our client for some time. It's a grasshopper. It's not very tasty, but the United Nations has asked us to rethink the amount of meat that we consume, especially in Europe, in the United States. So here we're looking at insect-based powder uh, and turning it into a system that we can produce inside cities. So here's comparing 100 acres of land to make cattle and then 100 acres of urban space to make the same amount of protein, but from insect powder instead of cattle. You save 200 times, sorry, 300 times the amount of greenhouse gas emissions and 2,000 gallons of water per gram of protein using crickets versus cows. So it's an enormous uh, uh, savings when it comes to the environment. This is the project that we had built in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. It's now in the Philadelphia Museum of Fine Art. Uh, here we're looking at different containment systems. Each one is about making life for crickets amazing until they die naturally after six weeks and they're harvested and they're turned into a flower. Over that time, we feed them really well. They get apple cores and lime rinds and orange peels and they get really fat and juicy and happy. They move throughout the entire shelter until their last week of life. They hang out in these large sacks at the end and they sort of they get harvested when they're, they're done and, and they're milled into a flour. We turn them into bagels, bonbons, pasta that tastes amazing. And it's an excellent source as an alternate form of protein than lamb, cow, chicken, etc. cetera. Uh, those, those fins on the top are actually uh, instruments that magnify the sound of the horny males. So when the crickets are really happy, especially, and they're done surviving, the men do something called straddulation. They move their wings back and forth. They get really riley. They meet the females and they reproduce at a high throughput rate. And these things called uh, cricket sex pods. Inside the sex pods, I don't know exactly what goes on except for a lot of cricket sex because they feel safe and comfortable and they're well fed and they spread their genes throughout the shelter. Then we harvest them and eat them. Other things we've been doing these last two projects because uh, we're just gonna do a quick introduction this is the urban farm pod. So this is bringing food to your home and doing it in a way that's modular, unitized, and something where you have a relationship between what's on your plate and the stuff that you eat. So here you grow high yield crops on the surface of the sphere. So it's not a green wall, it's a green ball. And you do things like spirulina or wheatgrass or uh, you know anything you wanna grow. You can grow it on the inside as well as on the outside. It's part furniture, part farm. You actually can turn the entire thing to get solar income. It can go on a balcony, a rooftop, uh, you know, an empty lot. And they're meant to be put in urban spaces or in tight areas. And you kind of grow your food and sit inside your farm and eat it if you want. And then kind of the last project that we're doing with uh, ODA uh, and changing from what we're doing in New York to this LA project, and Ron will talk about that in a bit, is very much about designing for a creature that's disappearing. So this is the monarch butterfly. We've lost 90 million of these insects in the last few years. The US Fish and Wildlife Services are saying that we're endangered of losing them forever. And these are abs absolutely magnificent, charismatic creatures. They're almost all gone. So here we're thinking of a double skin facade system where the butterflies live inside basically the fenestration of the building. That's it. Asking the client just to devote three and a half foot of extra space so that this creature can survive as a way station. So it can move in and out and enjoy life and get a chance to live, provide it for areas for its food, areas for where it can propagate, rest, mud baths, all the things it needs and enjoy uh, you know, life as it could be. And we've had these feeding systems, et cetera, to make sure that these butterflies are 
well fed. Also magnifying the life of the butterflies on these screens on the outside so we can talk about or you can show others what's happening because the drama of butterflies is very small. So we want to blow that up big and get folks excited and, and asking what, what's happening in this building. I see it's a sanctuary for monarchs. We want to save them. We do this work for the American Museum of Natural History. These are the feeder systems that we've been doing and the insectarium. And a lot of other projects we're working on with their new addition to the Natural History Museum. To get to the technology of this, we integrate the needs of the butterfly directly into the concrete of the building itself. We start with large scale 3D prints. We then use a different type of concrete here with BASF, which is uh, called GreenSense. It's impregnated with fly ash. It's a low embodied concrete system. It can last 200 years. It's fireproof and it's structural. We pour it into these molds made from the 3D prints. We can make thousands of these molds, all of them geared to the needs of the butterflies such as mud baths or perch points or areas for respite or nectar feeder zones. All of these areas fit into the facade. Here's the actual facade that we had designed for the uh, Smithsonian for the Cooper Hewitt, showing the butterflies inside that system. Uh, there are areas of eyelashes that attract you to windows so people inside their building can look out and have a kind of a relationship with the monarch and, the, and, and their own space that they're in now. This is showing all those different surfaces and, and uh, different vines and ivy that hang from those surfaces. The feeder points made out of bioplastics and nectar zones where they can drink, uh, areas for specifically air quality. But the goal here, and this is kind of the final bit, is to put biodiversity in our buildings, put it inside our streetscapes and to change and increase biodiversity in our cities. This is uh, one of the monarchs inside the shelter system that's in the Smithsonian where they're freely able to go inside and out and enjoy this like sliver of, of uh, space as their sanctuary and give them this opportunity that they desperately need uh, so that they get a chance to restart their lives and rewild the city. Anyway, that's just some of the things that's inside the book and what we're up to uh, lately. And I don't, I don't wanna take up too much time because everyone else has got really interesting, exciting things to talk about as well. So I'll just come back to, um, to this and I, I wanna hear from everyone else. Thanks, Thanks for listening. Just one quick question about the butterfly project. Is that a real project? Do you have a site for that? Do you have a client? Do you have a budget? Is that something that will get built or is it speculative? Yeah, that it, yeah, it started off in, in Lolita in Soho uh, with Jackie Jingbea and Andrew Chris were, were interested in building super. They came to us as clients and then we sort of turned them into patrons to help save butterflies and work on butterfly conservation. And now we're working on this project in LA. We'll probably be the first time of I've lost you a bit there, Mitch. Can everyone else hear me? Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay. I'm Ah, uh, you're back. You're back I was here. saying uh, we're working with ODA to. Let's move on to Aaron then. Yeah. Aaron, if you could pick up from there, since you're working with Mitch on on some of these projects, talk talk about um, your book and um, just talk us through that, please. Sure. Um, thank you again. Fascinating things with Mitch. Definitely grew my appetite for uh, Grasshopper. Um, I'd say the the uh, the book unboxing New York here. Um, it is sort of a um, diary, if you will, not a monograph or, or a manifesto, but, but rather um, sort of a collab collaborative efforts to uh, weave two things together, the life of a young firm in New York City as we kind of find our way in the world and uh, uh, trying to weave and embrace pragmatism as a springboard for innovations, um, for taking control uh, in the architectural world with a can-do approach and, and so let me uh, just show you a few examples and All right, can you see that? Oh yeah. Sorry.
There we go. So the book is divided into five chapters, living, zoning, developing, marketing, and building, which we think are sort of the, the new pillars for uh, pragmatism in, in urbanism. Uh, but basically what we do is we try to reduce kind of monumental questions like social and environmental sustainability into very pragmatic uh, kind of questions about our cities. For example, the fact that uh, most of our buildings are kind of two-dimensional dead-end corridors. We enter, we go in the elevators and we end up at, at a dead end. Can we kind of accept that or should we challenge that this building basically using the typologies of the green roof as a connector between every floor into that circulation, um, basically creating these opportunities for um, and not only a, a green roof, but, but engagement in social environments in a totally different way. Or questions like the facade, you know, facade is, is sort of the um, threshold between inside and outside life. And it's been reduced uh, to a paper thin curtain walls. Can we look at it? Um, more like a man-made terrain where uh, uh, we can promote biodiversity, but also human engagement, so the freedom of choice to be connected to nature uh, or to others. This is a project we're doing and is under construction in, in Rotterdam right now. Uh, simple questions like the relationship between buildings and streets, especially in New York City, we kind of came to accept the formula that streets are the uh, the main areas of, of uh, public uh, communal, the, the public realm, and uh, we've taken two city blocks and broke them down into five interconnected courtyards that are linked into a main uh, kind of park, which was a demapped street. Um, Aaron, Aaron just, can I just, I don't think I, we can see your presentation. Can anyone see Aaron's um, presentation? It's not up on the screen, Aaron. I don't know if you can fix that or, or just show us the actual book maybe. Okay. Uh, let me see. You, you don't see find... the screen at all? No, if you, if, if you tried to share screen at the bottom, it's a little green arrow at the bottom of the Zoom window. Oh, so you didn't see any of that? Mm -mm. We're too polite to interrupt. There we are. Okay, there we go. All right, there we go. And if you could make that full screen now, so we just see the the relevant image, I guess you play you presentation. So, yes. Better. Ah, yeah, yeah. All right. So forget everything I said. <laughs> I just continue where I stopped. We talked about that, that the idea of the uh, sort of the main main terrain and our project in, in Rotterdam that you see here. Uh, and um, this project in Brooklyn, which is, is basically questioning uh, the New York City block, if you will. We, we all kind of got used to these mega blocks and we've broken down into a series of smaller uh, interactive uh, courtyards that are connected through a main park where this has just allowed us to kind of uh, reveal in new ways by which we can uh, get people together, but also uh, present art. Uh, these are main kind of painted murals on mega walls and uh, with the amazing green and urban farming and how they all kind of integrate together and what you wouldn't expect maybe from a typical residential development. Um, zoning is a typical uh, sort of typology or, or actually subject we all love to hate. Um, and if you think of every city, they give you kind of these rules that narrows our thinking. And, and we're just demonstrating through the book a ways uh, by which um, reading through the fine prints can actually allow us to create uh, new typologies of interactions and the same approach we're taking towards uh, development. So we, we know now, uh, and maybe it's unfortunate that 90% of the built environment is dominated by the private sector, um, but instead of resenting it, can we collaborate and take control of the narrative? This is a, a building down in downtown Manhattan where we've kind of flipped on its head the wedding cake typology, pushing basically most of the residents up above, opening the views and exposure and the biggest footprint is actually the common roof. Uh, and by that, how we do it, we're basically convincing developers of the value added by pushing everything up. So I wanna just uh, touch base on what Mitch and I are working together at Terraform. This is a tower in LA. And what starts as a maybe a kind of a, a basic uh, typology, it's gonna be the highest tower in downtown LA as a stretch uh, extrusion on a base um, we put our kind of uh, our ambition in two locations. 
the communal housing at the middle of the tower and the way that it integrates with the ground uh, by recessing and to studying wind uh, uh, behaviors, we've been able to create substantial amount of outdoor spaces up on 600 and 700 feet in the air uh, and share those with the, the community of the building, but also the base, which was the biggest challenge of how we treat uh, or how we skin around a parking podium. Everybody hates that. Um, and beyond just landscaping it and ingreeding public spaces, we've kind of reached out to meet with Terraform and says, can we implement your idea of the butterfly sanctuary in a real, real project? Um, this entire facade is gonna be covered by the brilliant uh, panels that we just described and will bring thousands of, of a butterfly back to downtown LA uh, in a way that not only uh, function in reality, uh, in terms of its purpose as a screen, but also really treat the facade as the terrain and become a beautiful combination of biodiversity, artisserie, and uh, facade. Um, and beyond everything, um, an educational facility for the general public, uh, creating aware for biodiversity, understanding and explaining how this could be implemented on what we call everyday uh, building. This project is in the final stages of approval and we're very hoping to start construction soon. So that's kind of a snapshot, a quick uh, view. And let me stop sharing. And I'll just say that I think the best outcome of our uh, 50 projects we've done in New York City and other projects we're doing around the world is through collaborations as such uh, with Mitch and Terraform, we can actually bring uh, to reality uh, some brilliant ideas into what we call everyday buildings. And I kind of encourage that, um, that narrative uh, for everyone. Great. Thanks very much, Aran. And um, Julia, over to you now. Great. Thank you, Marcus. So presenting the book low tech um so i in thinking about sustainability which i actually taught sustainability and technology for quite a while uh rather than focusing on the high tech um i've been really interested in uh other type of technologies um, and found that some of the most innovative technologies that we have actually exist within the indigenous communities who aren't really thought of as incredibly innovative and so these technologies are actually commonly mistaken as primitive but they're extremely sophisticated ways to cite technology in nature and this is an example of a temporary fishing dam that the Anawane tribe in the Amazon create annually for fishing and for transportation. Uh, this is another example from the book, which is the living root bridges that you can find in Meghalaya in northern India that are grown across monsoonal rivers. They're the only bridges that can withstand the rains that come through this landscape and uh, that turns this forest into like forested islands. And these bridges are grown from a single living ficus elastica. This is a double decker and they have a triple decker bridge that is being grown now. And the the concept of low tech really talks about changing this idea that these technologies are low tech, T-E-C-H, to consider them as low tech, T-E-K, which means born of traditional ecological knowledge. Um, that's a word that I made up, but the byline is designed by radical indigenism. And that's this idea of rebuilding our knowledge base, especially about sustainability from traditional ecological knowledge. And just explaining the, the way the book works, it's divided into four ecosystems, mountains, forests, deserts, and wetlands. One of the examples from the mountains is the Palian rice ter terraces by the Ifugao people who live in the Philippines, who terraform their very uh, elevational mountainous landscape at 80 degree scale. So synonymous to the scale of New York City skyscrapers. And there's always this comparison of what could we take into a contemporary urban context and rethink our generic urbanism to really think of pushing it forward to a radical localism. These are uh, images from um, in Iraq, the Madan community who create their whole civilization in water on these islands, which they build from a single species 
And then part of the book is comparing these technologies, which appear all over the world, very similar technologies, but without any communication. So these are optimal technologies for these environments. This is the Euros who live on Lake Titicaca. And then looking at these technologies the way an architect rather than an anthropologist would look at these technologies as systems constructed of a module and then having a system and a structure and then creating an infrastructure that this one is a buoyant infrastructure that remains buoyant for 25 years uh, because of multiple means of decomposition. And so when we're thinking about architects designing floating cities, there are many examples out there that we can look at from the past to draw into the future. The other big point about the book is that we can also look at climate resilience, not by just trans uh, migrating technologies from communities that have afforded modern technologies that deal with flooding, but we can look at communities that deal with flooding every day and what their technologies are. So enhancing local resilient technologies. So in Jakarta earlier this year, half a million people were displaced by flooding and there's a plan for a new Delta concept by the Dutch. Uh, they use a polder dike plus islands to recreate a more um, resilient coastal Delta landscape. But right nearby is a system called the Sawatambak which allows water to come in, to grow food, it's flood resilient, it's carbon sequestering, has these amazing qualities, but it's not considered as a resilient infrastructure, it's considered as an agricultural system. So it's really rethinking what might be technology and how we could apply that to urban design and urban thinking that would actually enhance local knowledge bases, local materialities and biodiversity because we're building from technologies that come out of these communities. This is also another example of the a picture of the Sawatambak. And it's a system that is based upon aquaculture. And so it's a biological system that grows rice and fish and then allows floodwaters and it's specifically designed for one to two meters of uh, intertidal area. And then the book actually starts looking all around the world at similar technologies. So while the Indonesians have their own polder dike system, so do the Chinese have their own polder dike system, which protects the city of Hujiao from flooding. But this particular polder dike system integrates silkworm rearing, mulberry, mulberry dikes, and fish farming as well. So it produces silk. So they're very unique, but also very similar. And the last one that I will show is a system that is sitting, it's an aquaculture system as well. It's on the outskirts of the city of Calcutta, and it processes sewage water coming from the city of Calcutta of 15 million people, half of that sewage water every single day through an aquaculture system. It grows 16% of the food for the city. It's 300 fish farms that began as a single fish farm by a very industrious and entrepreneurial farmer who discovered that free sewage could feed his fish and produce fresh water plus food. And now it's expanded to 300 fish farms that clean half the city's water. And the process by which it happens is a process of bacteria, algae and fish, which I think we might come to consider our next, uh, next green technology or our, our next green energy, which is energy that is produced just from biological reactions. So this is a chemical free and coal fired free wastewater treatment system that provides 80,000 jobs and free food and fresh water. And so just to finalize, this image is also again, the living root bridge. And the big question of the book is to pose, you know, what might, might we discover by looking at these hundreds, if not thousands of indigenous technologies in existence that we haven't even looked at as a form of technology that we could integrate into our built environments if we were to hybridize them with contemporary construction techniques, uh, material um, uh, studies and different, ma different materialities plus structural systems under different forms of governance that could really create what that next symbiotic city might be. Thanks, Julia. And finally, Paul, over to you. All right. Hey, everybody. So um, first and foremost, I want to just say it's an absolute pleasure. Um, Aaron lives around the corner from me in Tribeca. Mitchell's up in Harlem at the moment. I think, Julia, you're in Boston now, or are you in New York? 
Um, this idea of a distributed network of conversations, this is something that really intrigues me. Um, at the moment, I'm in the middle of finishing my book. So what I'm gonna do is kind of give you guys a little bit of the backdrop for thinking about um, the conversation as a dialectical process. What I wanna do is begin with a sense of how much the arts and the notion of science and technology have been in this kind of collision course between code and culture for the last several centuries. Now, how does that tell a story? Uh, my next book is called Digital Fictions, The Future of Storytelling. So I wanna kind of begin in the present moment. And here we are in a pandemic era, and I'm sure many of us have seen these. Uh, this is a, a surgical mask that's a little bit in the same league as, a, as what they call an N95 mask. Now, the gentleman who invented that is a Chinese gentleman um, named Dr. Wu Lin Te, that um, basically during the, one of the major plagues, it's almost been a hundred years of, uh, since the last major plague of influenza. And what he ended up doing was creating this face mask in the middle of an epidemic um, to help people think about design and space and the aerosolization of when people were coughing or sneezing in uh, Hong Kong and various other Cantonese areas under the Chinese Imperial Court. Now, to me at least, the spread of um, what's happening with the pandemic situation also goes back to a couple other kind of fascinating moments as well. And one of those is this kind of idea that um, devices, objects, and design all have a kind of utilitarian purpose in everyday life. Um, when we think of the tools around us, um, my last book was called The Imaginary App, and it was all about commissioning different artists and writers and creatives to think about how algorithms had changed the tool making process of our time. So I'm just gonna show another quick example here. This is obviously about fractals in nature. What you can see here is this is a fractal dimension and a plant, um, and these are usually optimized to gather sunlight. Now, when we think about the ecosystem of our contemporary data-driven society, what we're seeing right now is an evolution or a collision between code and culture. Um, for me, at least right now, as I'm working on my book, one of the things that's really struck me during this pandemic moment is again, the historical dimensions of like literally a hundred years of thinking about um, how design and the methods and the tools of storytelling and narrative have intersected with how we think about the everyday evolution of a society that's been sort of consumed by digital processes. Um, now, one of the people who really helped pioneer that um, and think about graphic design here as well is a gentleman who I will bring up in just a second here, uh, who is a, a kind of a very famous figure in technology. His name is um, Vannevar Bush. And he's generally considered to be the, the earliest sort of person thinking about design and computers. Um, he created a um, device called the MIMEX, which basically stands for the memory index. Um, and generally, this is what it would look like. You're gonna see here, um, Essentially, uh, right around World War II and a little bit earlier, Vannevar Bush had left MIT to help set up a series of initiatives to get the US government to think about computational power um, and being able to index the sheer volume of information that was being generated by the war effort. Now, um, Alan Turing is usually generally considered to be the inventor of modern computing. And anyone who's using a device, we're all thinking about the devices we're on, the networks we're using, you have to trace the kind of um, an archeology span here. If you're digging down, uh, there's a very famous moment where you had someone like Arthur Schlesinger, who's generally considered to be the discoverer of the city of Troy. Um, and Troy was a narrative, a myth for many thousands of years, but um, this German archeologist found the city and then dug and then he said, wait a second, there's all this dust. And he got rid of all the dust. Now I use that as a really funny example. And nowadays with molecular biology and other systems of analysis, you realize you actually really wanted the dust. So you could see what flowers are pollinating, what uh, bodies had decomposed, what they've been eating. And he wanted to make this weird, pristine, clean um, site. So the dust actually told the story of that time. So what I'm doing here is showing you guys a couple of different examples of not just narrative engines, so to speak, but narrative tools that help us think about a distributed idea. And of course, in the 21st century, we're in an era where data-driven narrative has actually created a crisis of democracy. Uh, one could argue um, the pandemic has actually led us right to the edge of a, a critique of how democracy can deal with crisis. Um, and for me, at least, that's a really intriguing moment because um, here we are and it's 2020 
and I wanted to show you this really quickly. Last year was the 50th anniversary of this, uh, this little weird device called the internet. So um, basically this is the internet circa 1969. And I would love for you guys to think about that plant I showed you earlier, the fractal dimension of the plant, because we're still in this era of exponential growth, but information age and data-driven narrative as an exponential relationship to how information shapes society. So what I've been working on with my book is thinking about how narrative tools um, kind of uh, think about notions of biocre and network systems that actually, say for example, if you're using artificial intelligence these days, um, the, one of the major themes everyone's talking about is deep learning or machine learning or what they call generative adversarial networks, GAN. Um, nature, like that plant I was just showing you, actually has a series of other kinds of biomimicry processes that we're just trying to anthropomorphize. So the internet, one could argue, if you look at, I'll just show you another kind of thing here. There was, um, I love using that one image of the internet in 1969 to give you a sense of how small it was. Now, of course, there's billions and billions and billions of devices, nodes, networks. And um, again, what you were seeing was a node and a vertex being able to actually mathematically generate these things. But this is, for example, a plant, a leaf, uh, a mathematical rendering uh, from Stephen Wolfram, who's one of the world's leading mathematicians, thinking about the, the basic functional term here is what you call algorithmic botany. And for me, at least, um, those are kind of thinking you know, like what, what someone like Buckminster Fuller would call systems thinking. Now, society is a story we tell ourselves. If you're in democracy or if you're in Sparta, amusingly enough, if you go back in time uh, to one of the first major plagues that was documented by Thucydides, um, I'm bringing this up because these are all kind of metaphors for nature and narrative. Um, so these are different forms of plants, uh, root systems, but actually they're quite mathematical. And this notion of the fractal dimensions of leaf shapes, um, you can actually straight ahead map onto a digital narrative. The operating term generally is what you call a decision tree or a logic tree. Um, for example, most of one of the most annoying things of this pandemic is say, for example, anyone out there who's trying to call for getting their bank account statement or for that matter, uh, trying to get uh, unemployment insurance these days. Um, you're going to be dealing with a logic tree or an ad, you know, artificial intelligence that analyzes your narrative, your speech, and it makes a decision. If you'd like to speak in English, press one. If you'd like this, press two, et cetera. So those are kind of the, the mythologies of our time, but put and embodied in the narrative tech, of technologies around us. Um, so one other kind of piece I just want to show really quickly, because I know um, I want to be respectful of everybody's time here, and by the way, these are all working notes for my uh, project. So it's, a, it's literally, amusingly enough, anyone writing a book about narrative right now, the whole world is now pivoted to a radical um, sort of immersion in digital narrative at every level. Uh, Netflix, for example, and anything else that you can possibly think of has radically changed everyone's sense of immersion. So uh, for my book, we did a series of studies of how much data goes through the internet every 60 seconds. Um, say for example, and this is 2019, and actually once the plague hit, um, all of these numbers spiked because everyone is using data far more than ever. So this is late 2019, every 60 seconds on the American internet, you'd had about 694 uh, hours, uh, 694 hundred thousand, 600,000 uh, hours of Netflix. Um, you'd have, uh, say for example, over a million Twitch views, um, Twitter would generally have about 500,000 to a million tweets every 60 seconds. YouTube would have about 4 uh, million videos being viewed every 60 seconds. And that's just America. And I'm using these as, as examples of narrative engines because these are the kind of, like I said, sort of the archaeology of the collision of code and culture that we're, we're living through, um, amusingly enough, from the viewpoint of the pivot to digital immersive technologies that this whole you know, pandemic has made everyone kind of respond to. So by way of conclusion, I just wanna show really quickly um, this notion of urban design and narrative because that's something that everyone is dealing with architecture and design for this conversation. Um, one of the things that struck me when we were talking about this conversation is how artists over the last century have dealt with urban narrative. And of course, one thing that really comes to mind immediately is um, this, which you're gonna see in a moment. This is one of the first narrative engines where artists took control of sound and the city. It's a, a portrait of the Italian futurist Luigi Russolo, and um, he invented the sound system, uh, as we know. And so in 1915, um, he wrote a book called The Art of Noise, Arte di Rumore. 
And amusing enough, the Italians have been dealing with this notion of urbanism and design from one or two angles that I think would be intriguing for the conversation. So if you go up uh, to the north of Italy, where there's a funny city called Venice, which we all know is now sinking and being completely immersed by water and other kind of issues around uh, the city sinking because it was made on these huge wooden uh, poles in the, in the uh, lagoon. Um, the city's water is clear now, um, animals are coming back, all sorts of stuff are happening. But they also invented the term quarantine there. Um, basically, the Venetians had an empire of trade at a certain time. Um, and right around the 15th and uh, 14th century, you had the Spanish Inquisition, which drove quite a few Jews out of Spain. And what ended up happening is that the Doge of Venice and the Ottoman Empire gave them refuge. Now, the reason I'm tying this to Italy is because that was like the first multinational corporation in a way. I mean, you had the Dutch East India Company, the British East India Company, and so on. But uh, this was earlier and in a funkier way because it was Venice. It's a city as nation state, as trade empire. And so when a ship would pull in, uh, the Doge of Venice put uh, many of the Jewish people on an island called Rua Traghetto, which basically means the ghetto. Um, but on top of that, the quarantine would mean that the ship would pull in and they would hold you on the ship for 40 days. That's where you get quaranta. And so it's just basically 40 days of being uh, uh, sort of cut off from uh, any biological, uh, quote unquote, purity or impurity, because also there was racial politics and there was a lot of racism towards Jewish people at the time. Um, probably, you know, obviously, still these days, too. So long story short, what I've done is give you guys a little bit of an overview of the thematic uh, dimension of my book. Um, and I'm hoping you guys will check in uh, when the book comes out with Duke University Press next year. All of my other books are on MIT. Um, and there's a lot more that I could show. But I wanted to just give you guys some sort of uh, thinking sort of bullet points here. And my favorite term right now is thinking about sort of like I said, the collision of code and culture and how the narrative engines of our time shape um, the, the sort of civic discourse. And so there we go. That's, that's it in a nutshell right now. Thanks a lot, Paul. And thanks a lot, everyone. I'm going to try and um, formulate some questions that we can ask equally to all of you, given the diversity of the presentations. Um, if we could just go through the same order, Mitch, Iran, Juliet, and then Paul. And um, the first question is, but the work that you've done to put these books together, the knowledge that you have, if you were to produce another book that responded to the coronavirus situation, how would the knowledge that you've got be able to be applied to that? What is the research that you've done suggested as a route forward for society facing this, this crisis? Not an easy question, I know, but uh, Mitch, have you got a, a response to that? Yeah, uh, sure, Marcus. Because, um, because with you, Mitch, you, I'm, at the beginning of your talk, you talked about how you had almost modeled um, various disaster situations and you gave the example of the, um, the hurricane. But did you see yeah. a pandemic coming? Did you think about how urbanism would respond to a pandemic? And another thing that struck me about your talk was that you showed images of New York, I think it was, with kind of like wildlife corridors and things like that. In a way, the pandemic is, 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 has preempted that and that wildlife is coming back to the city already. But what are, the, what are the lessons of the pandemic for the type of work that you do? What are the solutions that could be lying there? Yeah, uh, well, I, you know, Marcus, I was actually intrigued by the story you were telling about the insects early on, which is the idea that we're no longer, well, I don't know what the science is right now, so I shouldn't speak until all the facts are straight, but about two years ago in Germany, they were looking at uh, the amount of insects that uh, they were able to count over time. Entomologists uh, were doing this and they realized there was a massive decrease in loss in insects. And we had things like colony collapse disorder with bees, et cetera. And there's a whole host of reasons for why that was happening, mostly industrial and and ideas about pesticides and overdevelopment and encroachment upon the land. So, uh, you know, the, these things, because of the pandemic, have either slowed down, stopped, or are now being reversed. So I, I guess the, uh, the lessons learned from this pandemic is we can, we can see the effects of what happens when our climate is, begins its restoration process. We could see healing around us everywhere. And that's not the people that are here on this panel or people that are aware of these things to begin with, but that's everyone. 
the, especially the climate deniers or those who voted for certain leaders that are not quite working out as well as they should be. And that these, uh, these people are for the first time getting not a vision, but are actually steeped in this reality that the things that we need to survive, the things that are most important to us are here now. And if this pandemic teaches us something, it teaches us to really care about those things, to fall in love with them again, and to, to appreciate them. Uh, and, and that's what we've been working with at Terraform is to just, it's a kind of a, a, a clarion call, a wake up to just realize there's a lot of stuff we don't need, a lot of excess and affluenza that we suffer from. And uh, you know now in this kind of, this new place that we're in, we can appreciate that we share one biology between all peoples and all nations. It's, it doesn't matter who you are, you're affected by this virus, whatever religion or income class or sexual orientation, we are one peoples. And if we don't get it right now, like if we don't wake up and realize that, um, and I don't want to say there's like some kind of kumbaya moment, even though it sort of is, uh, but we can recognize we are one biology and, and do something about it. And that therefore the work that we have to do is not necessarily convincing others that it can, that um, these things are important. That now is already done. The crisis has happened. So let's work on civilization 2.0. Thank you very much. And Eran, same question to you. Um, like for example, the, the butterfly project, um, you could come up with a, an incredibly sophisticated way of trying to attract butterflies back to the city and give them somewhere to live. But the pandemic has shown that maybe all you need to do is like stop pollution and stop people spraying chemicals around and the butterflies will just pop back up on their own. Do you have any kind of insights into what this situation, the lessons for architects such as yourself could be? Well, first, I, I, I do share the sympathy that you, the story you told about London and, and Mitch uh, kind of uh, relation to the fact that regardless of what we think is going to happen, we know what's happening already. The skies are clear in, in Delhi and, and in China. The jellyfish is swimming in the canals of, of Venice. And there's more turtle laying eggs than in, in years and years before. So the, the pace by which uh, Mother Earth is recovering is very encouraging, but it's also very telling. Uh, and demonstrating in a way, um, in sort of an experiment we would never make otherwise, that how quickly and how swiftly we can, if we want, recover. That, I always talk about the fact that um, humankind have depleted the earth from its resources and, and destroyed the, the, the balance of nature without intention. I mean, we've done it out of ignorance more than anything. Imagine what can be done if we do put intention uh, and talent together into fix it. And I, I definitely think that this experiment, if you will, that we wouldn't have done otherwise, puts in front of our face, not us, but also politicians, the rest of the world, uh, some of the opportunities. The other thing which we've been doing um, prior and during the writing of the book was to document uh, the experience in buildings we've designed. So we were fortunate enough to design 50 buildings and build 50 buildings in New York City and, and many other places. We consistently go back to these buildings and ask people how they experience those uh, buildings. And that's a feedback loop that I think was missing in our industry for a while where architects doing stuff, assuming everybody's gonna love it. And this, this surprise, the, the, the results are sometimes surprising. And I wonder what would happen if we continued that survey today and survey people who've been stuck in their apartments in small, you know, in small apartments in cities for about two months. How's their experience now? And what's their perception of their housing condition, uh, the quality of their buildings and neighborhoods? And I would suspect that the answer would be that the sort of uh, explosion of excitement that happens in streets of Italy and Spain, where people reached out to their friends, waving and singing and praying together is the type of um, scalability in, in human interactions in city that we have lost uh, in the past uh, decades and we've lost it without thinking. And I think we need to come back and rethink those and we could very easily start envisioning um, way of life with nature and with each other that um, would compensate for, for that loss. So uh, I feel like, you know, as society and uh, as humanity, we've learned a huge lesson about what it means to stay home or what it means to be in a, 
in a sort of a cube apartment in some glass tower on Fifth Avenue or elsewhere, and how we can maybe uh, think of new ways to resolve that. And clearly, you know, the, the ecosystem uh, put a huge sign in our face that this is recoverable and we should do something about it very quickly. Thank you. And the same to you, Julia. I mean, in, in all of your research into um, uh, traditional ecological knowledge, did you find any indigenous solution to pandemic? Were there any kind of ancient versions of, of social distancing? Or, or is there any, what can, what can you take from the research that you've done and apply to this situation, particular situation? Uh, I mean, I would say first that pandemics have throughout history been uh, the trigger for amazing transformations of the way we interact with cities or architecture or art, nature. So city beautiful movements and the Italian Renaissance. So they came from these crises that we face. So I hope that we come out of this crisis with a similar transformative attitude and uh, that will take us into the next epoch of wherever we're headed. But habitat destruction, which I talk about and which these technologies are, are sort of uh, in, uh, trying to um, stop, that's the primary cause of zoonotic transfer. So that's the way this happens. If we remove habitat of these animals, it allows for that zoonotic transfer, but also the understanding that we need to have a relationship with nature. And there's a direct link with, between climate resilience or resilience of communities and epidemic that we can show. So we could see this as a bit of a canary in the coal mine. This is the precedent of perhaps a much bigger uh, oncoming uh, crisis of climate change. I was we're walking around these gas masks and, and uh, medical masks, but I was back in Australia for Christmas and everybody was walking around in the same thing because of all the fires. And these indigenous technologies, we know that in Australia, the fires went around the lands that still use these indigenous technologies. So there's a relationship with nature and understanding of developing and, and building within nature that we need to understand and draw back into our cities. So the homogenization of urbanism and the bulldozing of our habitats and our ecosystems is shifted to really an amplification of some sort of a radical localism that builds biodiversity back into the city. And I think the, the last point is that, you know, we, we are species that have to live with nature. And I think that's a mythology that living in cities, we've somewhat forgotten uh, and we've lost. And I think that the, the, work that I do is trying to build that mythology that humans can and must exist with nature back into the way we think and the way that we design cities today. You've kind of stolen my, my, my last question actually but we'll come back to you on that in a second and Paul for your presentation was um, slightly different from the others in that it wasn't so much about the relation a lot of the, the other ones presentations were about the relationship between architecture urbanism and nature. Um, Paul your presentation was more about narrative but in a way narrative or the failure of narrative has been like a defining moment of this pandemic in the the stories that we tell the way that we share information the way we try to figure out how to use a mask whether to use a mask how far apart we need to be from people it's been a it's been a messaging crisis as much as anything else so same question to you paul what do you think about the knowledge that, that you've done the research you've done how is that ap applicable to helping us in this situation well, you know, one, this goes to something that Aaron was talking to, and I'll just kind of pivot from there. Let's look at the idea of negative oil prices right now. It's, I'm really intrigued because we're, we're in a hydrocarbon economy and the fossil fuel war between Saudi Arabia and Russia right now has radically reduced oil prices. And anyone who's looking at derivatives or futures markets, it's been really fascinating to see the, the plummet of oil prices to the negative, uh, which, you know, it's like they'll actually pay you to take the oil away. Um, so it's been really wild to see that kind of price war. But the idea of a hydrocarbon economy that's been put into tailspin by this pandemic, people are driving less, people are walking more. And above all, this idea of what uh, Julie was calling sort of radical localism has really kicked into high gear. So to me, at least, um, what's been fascinating, seeing this, the right wing response, and uh, my nickname for this, of course, is somewhat ironically, is the Darwin Awards. 
um, you know, like people are angry, they're protesting. You see all these Trump supporters you know, angry saying, I need a haircut, I wanna go shopping, you know? And <laughs> you know, I'm like, hey, you know, give yourself a hug and cough on the next person at the protest too, why not? Um, and so you actually realize the ideology of the political right wing and the oil industry, like Coke industries, et cetera. All of these are, say for example, this year is the 200th anniversary of Darwin's voyage around the world. I'm just gonna use this as a kind of a, again, a kind of, when we think about cities, cities are stories. I mean, there's no question about it. The founding of Rome, you know, Romus, Romulus and Remus, you know, these two brothers that fought each other. Paris, you know, was a character out of the Trojan War who ends up radically having a city on this river Seine in, in France. Washington, D.C., uh, you know, Pierre L'Enfant, all these major architects, people refer to stories to name spaces and name places. Um, so these are things that really linger over the global discourse right now. And even if, it, again, I sorry to keep going back to the Greeks, but I'm fascinated with uh, the first major documented uh, epidemic or pandemic is in um, Athens, Greece, recorded by Thucydides in the fourth century. And the whole city's networks fell apart. Um, and people, there's a very famous phrase where he said, no one knew which gods to worship. No one knew which gods to placate to get the virus to go away. And uh, Athens was at war with Sparta, which was like the, you know, the Cold War. You know, you had communism versus capitalism. You had Athen Athens versus Sparta. And the Spartans had a whole different way of doing things. And, you know, the major figure of that time was Pericles, who led to the Athenian Renaissance. Um, and he died from this virus. But they, they were like, we got to rethink this thing called democracy. And if you actually go back to the root word of pandemic, epidemic, the root word is demos. Um, you know, same as democracy means people. Um, so amusingly enough, how we, our societies are engaging with this radical disruption of modern life um, is a mirror we're holding up to what is potential, you know, for thinking about post-digital capitalism, um, getting people to rethink the economics. I mean, the idea of negative oil prices is like people can't give away oil <laughs> right now. Um, it's going to be really fascinating to see the next several months because this is going to have to make everyone reset their idea of what is an economy and how that works under a reverse engineering of the hydrocarbon boom of the last two centuries. Um, the uh, you know, maximum industrialization, maximum production, consumption, everyone consuming far more than they need. Your average American's carbon footprint is over two tons of carbon every couple of months. You know, I'm sure somebody's out there measuring the, the radical decline of that just in the last couple of months and weeks. So the idea of digital capitalism um, and surveillance is also another issue. This is one thing I'm gonna just wrap up with. My nickname for this is now we're looking at the era of biopolitics. And what's happening is that um, the notion of this virus as redefining the, the subject and citizen is gonna be a big issue because obviously you can see the right wing here wants to go straight to immigration, straight to being able to define a citizen's relationship to access to resources. And of course, undocumented and other people who are outside of that narrative are gonna be kind of floating there. But on top of that, the notion of biosurveillance, um, whether you're infected or not, your cell phone might get us, if you're in Taiwan, Singapore, Korea, uh, these are societies and of course China that have radically restructured their whole notion of urban uh, space with one another by using digital methods of surveillance to tell you if someone's infected, you'll get a text message saying, wait a second, this place, you get, in China, you get a QR code that's either red or green right now. And all of the places that have closed down, everyone in that neighborhood is assigned a digital code that says if they're infected or not. And they're actually gonna be having a um, immunization or immunity passport, uh, which will redefine your notion of being able to move through different sections of a city. So the idea of lockdown and being able to have those control mechanisms not only on your cell phone, but actually defining your, your body and the space around you, get ready. I mean, it's gonna get pretty wild. And so I'll just leave it at that. Thanks, Paul. Um, back to the insect story of the, 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 the squashed insects on the, the car windscreen, which is something that we, we haven't experienced for a very long time. I remember when I was a child and I'd be out in the garden, whenever I saw a bug, an insect, I, I wanted to kill it. And I used to invent concoctions in a spray that would spray them then I tried garlic and I tried washing up liquid tried to get rid of bugs because I saw them as annoying and when I became aware a few years ago of this crisis of insect depopulation I suddenly realized how wrong I'd been to, to treat these things as annoying and so I completely changed my attitude my garden is now organic 
um, if I see if there was a fly in the studio earlier and I was trying to, rather than spray it as I would have done a couple of years ago, I was trying to sort of encourage it out of the door, which I successfully did. And um, I've even been putting like, you know, sugar water and jam out for bees that get stuck in the in the in the kitchen because we've got a, a glass ceiling and they can't they can't escape so this is leading up to my, my final question for all of you which is something that uh, julia preempted in her little talk just now which is that what does this situation tell us about the relationship between human society and nature uh, another anecdote i was watching uh, tiger king the other night and and they, they were one of them was one of the, <laughs> one of the animal park owners was arguing that this is crazy these animals are not wild animals anymore. There isn't enough space for them to be wild animals. There are too many hunters. They are now animals in captivity. So we might as well accept that, breed them lovingly, make them happy, but in a human controlled environment rather than the savannas of Africa or the, the jungles of India or whatever. Has the relationship between humanity and nature changed? Is it, is it, is it a them and us situation? Can we welcome um, wildlife into the city on its own terms? Or is, is effectively the natural world something that, that we control for our benefit? Big open question, but given that a lot of your talks have, have talked about the relationship between nature and the city and so on, what do you think about that, Mitch? Uh, I, well, I'll go very quickly. I mean, it's a great question, Marcus. I think uh, I'll, I'll look to the deep ecologists, Arne Ness uh, in, in Norway, and others, I guess now more modern versions like Tim Morton, which is dark ecology, but essentially our relationship to other organisms on this planet has been one of this kind of pyramidal hierarchy. Humans at the top and everything underneath us, they're all subservient to us. Whether it's a religious affect or posture where we're, we're supposed to be stewards of the land assigned by God, or it's just our opinion of, of creatures that we think are lesser than us. Um, I think that's the flawed model. I think the real model is that we are in this interconnected web of life. Everything has a kind of a consequence and an impact from the smallest, most meekest piece of fungi. Even a virus, which doesn't even fit in the kingdoms, has an extraordinary impact on all of humanity. And that we need to be inside this kind of condition that, that has this very complex series of lattices and webs where all things are mixed together. So I, I think that that's really, it's the switch of the hierarchy. No more pyramid with humans on top. Aaron? Well, I mean, uh, I think it's a very interesting question and I'm, and I'm very uh, intrigued by also by Mitch's answer because I'm, I'm, I'm envisioning to myself the days before human kind of took over, right? Where, where we were small enough and we were one of the animals of the earth. And I'm envisioning uh, or questioning the fact that we'll be willing to go uh, walk, to, uh, walk to the office in the morning and be eaten by a tiger or uh, you know, be eaten by a lion. And to what degree are we willing to really bring back the balancing act of nature and human as equal? because I think it's a bit of a myth and, and maybe a bit of a fantasy, which we all give an outlet when we go to Africa and we enjoy safari tours, which also are in a way a fantasy of what's not really real because these are kind of bordered areas by which uh, no wonder we call them game, game areas. So, so this is, this is a, a major conversation and, and a dilemma, I think, to what degree we're willing to kind of uh, bring back uh, the balance uh, of nature and to what degree we want to control it. And, and I feel, uh, and that's my feeling, that the, the myth of bringing it back the way it was is not going to happen. I think that what's going to happen potentially is we as human, by consciously understanding the damage that we've done, engineer a new world by which we make place for nature to be part of our life still controlled, but make more place for it. At the end of the day, uh, the goal for me at least is the quality of, of humankind, the quality of life of human. Not that I don't care for the bugs, which I do. I just think at the end of the day, what is really important to us is human for our sustainable wellness and mental and health. And nature is part of what makes us uh, human. It part of what makes us poetic. It's part of what makes us uh, sensitive 
Uh, and I think we need to find engineered tools, and we are to some degree, by which we can bring that nature better uh, into our life uh, to a point of balance that we can feel comfortable with. Thank you. Julia? No, I, I completely agree with Iran. I, you know, there's a misconception that humans can't coexist with nature. And I think that was also born at a time of, um, you know, a couple hundred years ago when we decided that we were going to take of all the thousands of technologies that exist at the time, one of the technologies from Western Europe or from a certain demographic in a small geographical context. And we would bring that through as our base of technologies with which we have evolved our cities and coexist with today. And the idea that we can only shift the trajectory of climate change by conserving forests or wetlands is false. We can develop huge aquaculture systems that still clean our water, that be become huge nature-based infrastructure infrastructures for our cities. We don't, we have a certain model of development, which is just one model and not the only model of development. And getting back to the Darwin comment, there's you know this idea of the, the survival of the fittest in the last 15 years has transitioned to the idea of the survival of the most symbiotic. And if we start to look at life, all life is based upon symbiosis, some form of symbiosis. And so we could think of our cities as uh, symbiotic as we are, as we need plants to breathe, uh, you know, that we won't exist without that symbiotic relationship. So that understanding needs to really evolve our thinking in the systems and technologies of our cities. Thank you very much. And finally, Paul. Paul's Paul, gone. you're mute. Uh, yeah, there we go. One of the things that's really struck me about this moment is the deceleration of culture. Uh, Paul Virilio, the philosopher, he sort of coined the term sort of chronophobia, you know, thinking about the, the, the I mean, his, his essays on the bunkers of World War II are pretty brilliant. I don't know if you guys have ever seen his photography, but he did these bunker uh, portraits um, that showed that the Germans had a radically different view of time than the French and the collision of those two ideologies during World War II radically changed architecture. Um, it was called the Maginot Line, where so the French had built all these bunkers and the Germans did what you call Blitzkrieg and just blew right through it. You know, just they, they came in over and around and every other dimensional aspect. Really amazing uh, study of war and time. Uh, there's another philosopher whose work influences my thinking on this as well, is Manuel de Landa. And he has a really good book called War in the Age of Cybernetic Machine, or uh, War in the Age of Intelligent Machine, sorry. And, Right now, what's happening, I think, with this whole pandemic situation is we really have to rethink capitalism. Uh, we've had several centuries of this idea of the, the notion of scarcity and of the Protestant value, notion of um, the Protestant work ethic. You know, you work till you die, uh, and then you go to heaven or whatever. Right now, amusingly enough, everyone is in this floating suspension of uncertainty about time. We don't know when this is going to end. People are sitting in, in quarantine, self-isolation, social distancing all of which radically transform any of the economic notions that made cities work in the 20th century. Um, so for example, in 1918 with the, the influence epidemic, people weren't really sure what was happening. And so they would gather, they'd go to a speakeasy, uh, they would, you know, you'd have a parade in the middle of Philadelphia and the next two weeks later, you have body bags everywhere and mass graves. Um, one of the things that's heartbreaking right now is we have, this sort of ideology of the middle of the 20th century, so the baby boomer generation of, in the form of, of Trump, who's this, you know, it, I, my nickname for Trump is like, he's Russian malware at this point, you know, it's kind of, um, you know, sort of the president as, you know, a broken system. Um, but on the other end of the spectrum, people are really beginning to rethink a notion of crisis in society and economics. And I think that that's one of the most powerful tools to give us a reset for the 21st century, which is radically rethinking. A lot of people are working from home. They're not moving and using a car just to drive to the grocery store. You name it, the list goes on. So um, and Mitchell mentioned uh, Timothy Morton, who's a friend of mine. He's a great, he has a great book called Hyper Objects. And Arne Ness out of Norway is also a big influence in my thinking. But what I want to kind of leave lingering over this conversation is, can we imagine a world beyond capitalism 
And one could argue the virus is actually a reflection of loss of biodiversity, the destruction of forests. I mean, even the Wuhan wet, you know, wet markets where all these crazy animals were gathered in one spot was a mega mix, you know, for DJ culture, you do, you, it's like you've just thrown every mixtape you've ever heard on Canal Street in one room <laughs> and hit play, um, you know, and you would just hear the cacophony of all these viruses swirling through that room. Um, and recently, um, and I'm just gonna wrap up with this, they showed a really interesting time-lapse map of when someone got infected at a restaurant, someone who didn't know they were infected, but the air conditioning of the room was blowing the air from the person. So their particles, um, infected, like, I can't remember the direction of the air conditioner, but the, the artificial air from the air conditioner blew the person while they're sitting there sipping a wine, cha-cha-cha, chatting with someone, and then their, their particles are going, their dust is going to somebody. Like, nine other people got infected just by the one person because they're sitting in front of an air conditioner. So we're going to have to rethink the air filtration systems. We're going to have to rethink how buildings work. The same thing happens with Legion's disease in the 70s. Remember this one, where, like, you're on a cruise ship and you you breathe some air conditioning. And so all of these things are radical inefficiencies. Um, so I just think that this is a place where architecture design and of course a culture of reimagining the near future um, can kind of leave us with some solutions that we haven't been thinking about yet. And that's where I think these kind of conversations are really helpful. Um, and yeah, I'm just a big fan of everybody's work here. So it's really a pleasure to hear everybody. Thanks a lot, Paul. And thanks to all of you. And I, I want to, to end with um, the anecdote that Mitch told at the beginning about the grasshoppers, about designing that kind of like paradise for grasshoppers, the fat grasshoppers who had sex rooms and things like that. And maybe, the, maybe to summarize the conversation is that we need to start thinking about the grasshopper as the clients, as well as the humans that we use the building, or the butterflies as the clients, as well as the humans, or the, the plants, <laughs> or the bugs, or even the spiders. Thank you all very much. It's been a great, um, fascinating conversation. And um, good luck with your books. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you so much. There are, much. There are, links, there are links to all of these guys' books in the post on Dezine. So if you want to buy it, you should be able to click through and, and do that. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Bye guys.